was born in a place called Anderson School in Fortune Bay. That's about uh, approximately 40 miles in the bay from Grand Bank. I was born in 1901. I started to go to the bank fishery when I was 14 years of age. Captain Arch Thornhill, 74, last of the sailing skippers of the Grand Banks. There wasn't much else for the go at them times. We didn't have a very much education, as you know. Grade five then, I don't know what that would be now, what grade eight would have been around there. So that wouldn't be very much now if you only had grade eight. But anyway, seeing all the rest of the, the men around there as he got old enough and went on, I guess it was in our blood, you know. So I uh, I got a man, asked a man to take me in Dory. I paid him. I had to make three offers though. Before, first time I offered him twenty dollars, and next time I offered him forty, and a week or so after that I went to him again and offered him sixty. Take me in Dory with him, you see. He would be the Dory skipper, you know. But anyway, he finally made up his mind. He took me in Dory. So we left for the banks. We would leave for the banks at that time about, I guess, it May month, I think. That's when we we'd go to Grand Bank, fit up the schooner down to Grand Bank. So. Probably one schooner from the company it was out from would come in Fortune Bay and pick up all the men. There would be probably seven or eight, probably yeah. ten schooners from that company, and I guess. 90% of the crews would be in Fortune Bay. So one schooner or two schooners would come up and come up in Fortune Bay and pick up the men, you know, take them all aboard. I've seen so much as a hundred men aboard of one schooner go out to Grand Bank, you know, enjoying your sh the schooner you were going on. And then we'd, uh, what we call fit up, we'd uh, stick up our gear, you know, get it ready. What I mean by sticking it up, we put ginges on the lines, then put hooks on the ginges, and, We'd have trawl tubs, four tubs in the dory. And we, when we get our, get fitted out in Grand Bank, take on supplies, and we'd be there probably a week fitting out. Then we'd leave and go in Fortune Bay again in the schooner and get a supply of bait. And then we'd go out on what we call our first baiting. And we'd fish uh, about four baitings in the spring, which would be the spring trip. Like I say, you'd go off on the Grand Banks, you'd be off probably 200 miles, perhaps 240 miles, and sometimes 100 miles, 150 miles, like that. Grand Banks is big banks. Then we go on what we call the Western Bank sometimes, Mizzen Bank, Bank Quero, and some pier banks. And when we get on the banks, we'd anchor our mothership sometimes, and we'd leave the mothership in Dory, take so much gear to Dory, probably, well, if you had four tubs, 10 lines in a tub, that would be 40 lines. You go out and sit that gear, and then you come board your mothership and uh, get something to eat, a snack, and you go out and take that gear back. Probably you get two or three dory loads of fish out of that much gear, and you come aboard and put it aboard your mothership and go on until you get your, all your gear in. The day will be finished then, and go down and have our supper. We're getting well up for dark then, sometimes after dark. Then the, the hardest work of the day was just to start then. We'd have to dress that fish, you see, that's split it, and salt it. Salt fish in all them times, you know. And probably, oh, to take probably, if you had a fairly good day's work of fish, to take it till 12 or 1 o'clock in the night before you get that dressed. Then you'd have to eve out again, 2 o'clock in the morning, for the bait your gear. Then you go down to have your breakfast. You'd have beans for breakfast, hot buns, so on. Not the same as it is today. Well then, when it begins to get daylight, you're about to have your gear finished. Then you get in your doors again then when it begins to get light and do the same thing over again.
one summer particularly that we was 72 hours, twice one season, and never closed the hall. We turned out of our bunks 2 o'clock Wednesday morning, and we never seen them no more for 9 o'clock Sunday morning. We was on a lot of fish, you see. But everybody wouldn't do that. I mean, it, it, I never ever did anything like that after I was given myself. I never kept any men up any more than, you know, I kept them up the first 24 hours. I was good, and a good many more like me in them days after a little later, you know. After 24 hours, then the next night, I was good and sure my men had three hours sleep anyway. Three or four hours sleep, you know. It was good for it then. But at them times, you know, you know, there was nothing you could go at to make so much money in, in such a short time as you could fishing. I mean, you take six or seven months, you know, if you was make six or seven hundred dollars, averaging a hundred dollars a month, boy, that, that was good money them times. But you see, what, what would kill it to be the next six months or so, you wouldn't be doing anything. So after all, you know, it wouldn't be so very much. But you make a living out of it, you make good living because you come home in the fall of the year and uh, people to go and get their woods, their fuel and everything for the winter and there'd be time to, to have vegetables, you know, and help to take that out of the ground and everything like that. And then winter time we used to do a lot of hunting and caribou hunting and rabbit and partridge hunting and everything like that. So. I'd say it was a good 11 as, as anyone else was getting at them times. The sailing skills of Newfoundland seamen is renowned. They sail the Atlantic and fishing schooners to the banks and to the West Indies and the Mediterranean with cargoes of fish, often with just the basic knowledge of navigation. Well, the way it was in a sailing schooner, you had to depend on so much wind anyway. I mean, you had to have wind to sail around. But when it come too much, well, you, it would be pretty uncomfortable sometimes. We'd be on the Grand Banks. If we was anchored, had, had the mothership anchored and the storm come up, we'd just slack out. We had a 10-inch cable and a seven or 800-pound anchor and we just slack out, probably you slack out half of it, and then the wind still increased, you slack out whatever you had. There lots of cases, see the part of the cable and you go adrift, and then you get your, your foresail, we call it, you know, there's mainsail, foresail, jib and jumble on the schooner. Well, you put the foresail up, that's between the two masters, that's called the foresail. And we'd heave her too, what we call heave too, then we'd lash the wheel to winter, and heave her to and she'd just go and, you know, and hit the seas like whenever, she wouldn't be able to hit them right, but she'd take kind of down to it until the storm would be out. It'd be pretty rough sometimes. And I've seen it, and a good many have too, that you take her right down to what we call a reef force. Double, single reef, and then a double reef. And she'd just go along, and in lots of cases that I've seen sea come. We were one time up out of Cape St. George fishing, and a storm. I seen a sea come. We was hove to like that, you know, under a foresail dodging around. And it took the 11 dories right off a of dick. And the dick engine and everything was on dick. Leveler right clean. We had to abandon the trip and go come in, come in Grand Bank and get, a, get new dories and everything. That was quite a sea to do anything like that. I, I, I think there's a kind of a fear to it in a way, you know what I mean. You you, you see a big sea coming sometimes, I mean, he could, he could level everything off, you know. He could do a lot of damage. There have been a lot of damage done too, but I don't think afraid. I don't think you'd be afraid. And that, that, that time in particular, when they took the doors, we didn't have time to be afraid because it was just a, a storm while well, we was out in lots of them, but this sea came so quick before you knew anything. Everything was gone. Dories, deck engine, everything. And that's all you could do. At the turn of the century, there were hundreds of sailing schooners in Newfoundland. 
the wind was a useful and cheap friend. Schooners are still used, but it wasn't until as late as 1940 that the last wind-powered vessel had an engine installed. Captain Arch Thornhill was the master of that ship. This particular schooner that I'm telling you about now, that was the last sailing schooner out of Grand Island. And that far, when we came, when we did get home, if we'd have got home in there, which we did, that they were going to, the owners was going to put an engine in. But I, the next year, then I sailed the a vessel out of Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, and that was the last sailing schooner up there. So I fished that year in there, and the owners put an engine in that schooner for me. So that, from that on, and I had the, the power schooners, engines. If I had my day over, I'd do the same thing again. I worked hard, we all worked hard, not only me. I had wonderful men. I used to carry wonderful men. I had, I always say I had the pride of Newfoundland. A lot of, a lot of the men that went with me on, on the boats as captain today. I'm on the salvage course, I was a 10 or 12 skippers. I had to sail with me on the blue boat. Yes, Al, if I had my day over, I'd do it again. I'd do the same thing again. Like I say, I had to work hard, but I made a living. Didn't, didn't, I never made any millions or anything like that, because you take two and a half cents, for, that's, that's the most I got. I think the last few years I was at it, we got three cents a pound. But if we was getting what they're getting now, I tell you, 10 million pounds of fish, you'd be making some money, wouldn't you, a year? Yes, I consider I had a good life, I enjoyed it. fishing schooners ranged far and wide, from the southern Grand Banks to the northern coast of Labrador, spanning a thousand miles. Thousands of men went north for the brief summer fishery. It was here amongst the Arctic ice that Newfoundlanders and Labrador Eskimos met. The Eskimos often resented the fishermen. They were intruders. They took, but gave little in return. Right from the moment I opened them for the first time, my eyes saw foreigners. I was born to find ministers, Newfoundlanders, and schooners. When the fishermen from Newfoundland came to Labrador to go fishing, when I was still young, we lived together and we helped each other. We the Eskimos, and they the white men. Some of them are really nice, but some of them seem to want to dominate the Eskimos. At least this is evident, especially today. Martin Martin, 86, of Nain, Labrador, the most northern settlement on the coast. He is a wise man, an elder in the Moravian church, a man to be respected. A leader known all along the coast, Martin Martin represents the old way in a rapidly changing society. I can recall many, many things, but what I remember most of all is what I was taught by my father and mother when they were still living. They used to teach me when I was still very young of what to expect when I grew up. My father always told me that I should be a kind and understanding person so that when I became a man, I would have peace of mind. To this day, I cherish what my father taught me, especially now when things are not going so well. His teachings also helped me to have peace of mind when I was alone at the hunting places. He 
he told me many times to pray to God. And even today, I consider this to be one of the greatest gifts he ever gave me, to this very hour, to this very moment. After my father died, I had relatives. There were six of us. I was second to the youngest. I had only one younger brother, but we were all old enough to take care of ourselves. I was sassy and a bit of a hard ticket when I was younger. It seemed I had not a thing to worry about. And because that was the way I was, I hated to lose and be beaten in a game or a fight to see who was the strongest. We played all kinds of games, including skiing. The skis were three or four feet, five or six feet long. We laid them from wood. The snow was sloped like this. Our skis had straps so that our feet could slip out like this. And we would go up to the top of the hill and start coming down this way and that way. And if there was a bank or a bump, we would head straight for it, which made us jump into the air. And with luck, we would end up at the bottom all in one piece. I would like to change the subject now and talk about my early hunting days. I was a hunter as a younger man. Each time we went caribou hunting in the winter, we used to trap foxes. I always had a companion, and at times we would have one comatic, and other times we would have two or even three. On one of our fox hunting trips in the country, we ran out of the white man's food, although we had lots of caribou meat. Even at that time, we were pretty well used to this foreign food, so when we ran out of it, the other three teams went back to Nain, while me and my companion stayed behind. All we had left was a bit of white flour, but lots of caribou meat. We had a small tin stove in our snow house, but we would only make a fire twice a day, because there is no wood at all in the country. Every morning we would get up before the sun, boil our kettle, then put the fire out to preserve wood. After we ate, we would go to our many fox traps, and we would be gone all day until after dark. We would have nothing to eat during the day. We ate before the sun was up, and we wouldn't eat again until the sun was gone. We were used to this because we were trained that way by our fathers. These hunting trips would last about a week. In the summer, we would go seal hunting. I had my own kayak, and my brothers had theirs. I learned from my brothers how to use a kayak. When we went seal hunting, I would follow at a distance until I had learned well enough to go on my own. There was one man who I really respected because he never lost a seal after killing it, especially a square flipper. In the spring of the year, when you shoot a seal and kill it, it sinks like a rock because their blubber is not very thick. I wanted to learn from this man. So one time, when he went seal hunting in his kayak, I followed him from a safe distance.
When he got out among the ice pans, he pulled his kayak on the ice, put it on its side, and positioned himself in such a way that his gun was in readiness along with his kayak. He didn't pay any attention to me, although I knew that he knew I was watching him. As soon as a seal came up, he shot and killed it, threw his gun into the kayak, grabbed the paddle, threw his kayak out, and jumped into it. It seemed like one graceful movement. He paddled so fast that his kayak was low in the stern, and before the seal had time to sink, he was on top of it, put a harpoon into it, and had it aboard his kayak in no time. He was a man to be respected, and I learned a lot from him. I never saw another man who was as smart as he was, even after he was dead. The leaders, or elders, belonged to the mission. They were the members of the Moravian Mission Church. To be an elder, one had to be a good person with a clean mind. But nowadays we have changed, and a few of the same ones who belong to the church with me and along with me have changed. It is not the same anymore. What was predictable all along is happening. In days gone by, the younger ones used to pay attention to and obey their masters. But today, they don't listen anymore. It's as if we are driven to lead a much more difficult life from those days. The Eskimo society does not abandon its old. This year, Martin traveled 2,000 miles to attend an Inuit conference. His advice is still sought. If you want to say a few words now, you can begin and tell us about the meeting you attended in Cambridge Bay. The meeting was a very important one for us. It was about our land rights. The white man is coming from everywhere. Some of them are cunning and crafty. I have forgotten some of the things we talked about, but we now know the ownership situation. We have to make claims here in Labrador. Us, only us, should be in control. Those foreigners are not to do here as they please. But first, you all have to agree amongst yourselves. That was the understanding I got at the meeting. Now you must search your minds for answers as to how far and where the boundary is to be concerning our land in Labrador. Then we will control Labrador. What I say is the truth of what I heard. As long as this is what you want, you will now be able to do this. As long as you agree to do it, the land's measurements will be from west to east, north to south. You, only you, will have control over this. You must start looking for answers. You who are listening to me now, I say the truth. You can now have ownership, as stated, as long as you work quickly. We Labradorians should not disagree on this matter. We should come together as one, all of us. We are Canadians, and we belong to the Inuit Brotherhood. I am unable to come up with anything new that I can leave behind. I can only hope to pass on to others what has been given us and has been with us from the beginning. And that is the word of God. 
Ever since the ministers came to Labrador, they have been teaching us the word of God. Ever since they came, they have been telling us how we should live. And today, they still teach us the word of God. I only hope that the Eskimos throughout Labrador and all the people throughout the world would realize that it is only through God, by accepting God, that they can hope to lead a whole and happy life. I am an old man and have only a short time before I pass from this life. I have seen a lot in my time and there have been many changes. I would like all mankind to live a more happier life. I would wish upon them to please respect the day of rest. <laughs>